All right. Good morning, haters. It's time for another episode with my co-conspirator, Mr. Kendall Grooms. Good How morning. are you doing? Good. You look nice. Thank you. You went to court today? Court morning, yeah. You're doing the post-2019 court look, are you? Yeah. Yeah. The Everybody, he has, he has blue jeans on. I would have opted for PJ pants, so it's, that's still a step it's up. It's a Zoom court. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you got to zoom right over here for another riveting episode of I Hate Real Estate. Right. So let's put this podcast in session. Let's do it. I love it. I love the sound of a gavel in the morning. Similar to you. Yeah. So today we're going to dive into a message we received from a listener. Thank you to our listeners in other states. We have a reciprocal licensing state that we're going to be talking about. So just as a disclaimer, get a legal disclaimer going that we are not all Arkansas today. Correct. Jamie's not licensed in Florida to do anything. I'm not licensed in Florida to do anything. I am in Oklahoma and Texas, but not in Florida. Right. And I'm in Arkansas. And you're in Arkansas only. Mm-hmm. And so by doing this podcast, we're not creating any kind of legal relationship or providing any kind of legal advice or other real estate advice that an attorney could otherwise provide in the state of Florida. Boom. And there's your disclaimer from Mr. Groom <laughs> sweeping it all up. Um, but we did receive a message on the Facebook page that had this... Um, question posed and I'll say question but more of like a rant question and she'll appreciate that I said that because I got Mm -hmm. the whole story before the question but when something goes wrong in real estate there should be the right to rant about it right and that's exactly why we started this show so in the beginning of this rant what happened is she asked have you guys ever heard of a real estate agent keeping a house kind of for themselves or for a better offer when they are indeed representing the buyer. And so even though we have already disclaimed that we're not in Florida, we're going to play by the Arkansas rules for a couple reasons. One, we know them. And two, there is reciprocal licensing in the state of Florida. So explain to me or to our audience what exactly reciprocal licensing means with respect to real estate. It means if you have a license somewhere else, like in Arkansas, that that license would be recognized for you to perform certain activities related to your license in another state, such as Florida. Which is also a disclaimer that if you're a real estate agent with a license in Arkansas that you could practice in Florida very well if you go down there and learn the market and understand yep. what you're dealing with yep. and represent clients down there. And so for lawyers, it's there are reciprocal there's reciprocation with several states where you don't have to go like take the state specific bar exam, but it's not a reciprocal where I can just show up in Oklahoma, for example, and say, I have an Arkansas law license. Y'all recognize that. It's still a deal where you have to like practice for seven years. Uh, you have to apply and go through an actual application process. It's called the non-exam application process. Oklahoma and Texas, I did it there. And it takes six to eight months to get your license approved for use in those states. So it's not just something where I can go to Oklahoma, show up in court and say, here I am, I'm good to go, because they wouldn't be happy about that. Yeah, they don't like it when you do that. And the other part is with law, it's quite a bit steeper when it comes to those kind of barriers to entry as well to practice in other states. Whereas in Florida, you would go down there and take the Florida specific real estate law portion of the exam, but your other licensing would already kind of flow over per se you would still have to join a florida board a local board where you'd be practicing so there'd be a lot of fees and license transfer and all that stuff that comes along and then there's then there's nuances and changes from state to state whether it be real estate or law about how things operate like florida i know because i worked with a client recently on a transaction in florida um, where they were doing a 1031 exchange for a, a condo in florida to another beach condo in florida and they have all their own forms and stuff that they use and yep. they have a set and they you know there's a lot of beachfront timeshare Alligator type of things that change yeah. yeah and so there's the hurricanes there's a totally different set of disclosures that go into it considerations on those contracts that we don't ever deal with here and so right. we don't think about all the ramifications of each provision in those forms and thus the reason you have reciprocation is you still have to prove to us to florida that you can learn those things to be able to practice down there right and i i love that though because you kind of have an open door and you can walk through it with the proper understanding of what goes on there just like in california there were a million more rules and in las vegas a million more rules related to real estate appraisal than when i got to arkansas it was a totally different set so that being said moving right into her problem she basically sent the message and said look i had a real estate agent she was supposed to be my agent um it's very hard to find a house right now in this market as you can imagine because we're short on homes and heavy on buyers so it is a seller's market and um when you are a buyer we've had marquise on the show before so shout out to him where when you're a buyer and you're trying to find a house in this market, you have to have an aggressive agent and an agent who's willing to go to bat for you, but that also is your fiduciary. And we'll go back to that word in a minute and you can give us the terminology behind fiduciary. But the main problem she had was she felt as though her real estate agent cut her out of the deal, that she found a house that she really liked and was interested in. And when the buyer went to put an offer in, she was like, oh, 
I'll do that. And then ghosted her. Nowhere to be found. Can't get her to call her back. When she finally does figure this all out at the end, this house is under contract with someone related to the buyer's agent. So after I kind of dig into the story a little bit, find out that buyer's agent, let's say Kendall and I are family. We're kind of family. And you want a house and I am actually representing Aaron over here and we're going to take him in to buy the house. But unfortunately, your offer, even if it's not better, I mean, I like you better. No offense, buddy. Um, But if I like you better, is that a reason why I can give you the house over this guy? Nope. Because why? I'm your fiduciary, which means... Because you have a... Well, in this instance, you're not only a fiduciary, you have a contractual obligation with someone. Oh, here we go with the forms. (laughs) So you talk about all those other disclosures in other states, but we're the model state. A fiduciary just means you're held to a higher standard of care when you're dealing with someone. Um, Banks can be fiduciaries that are controlling your money. Uh, People that are acting as like a power of attorney or a trustee are held to the standard as a fiduciary. I'm not technically a fiduciary. Um, not technically. There, I mean, there's certain cases where you could be involved in it. Things like a trust account that I hold, right. though, can be considered a fiduciary obligation that you have to someone. So those types of things. It just establishes a higher standard of care that that person owes to someone else. And it's an understanding that if you ask them to do something, especially if you're contractually bound, but if you ask them to go make an offer for you, that you're going to be honest in that effort and you're going to go make the offer for them, whether or not your friend or family member also has an offer. And for me, I think this also comes back down to my favorite word, disclosure. Closure, because if you're acting as a buyer's agent for this client and for this client and they're in the same position looking for the same house and you don't disclose you have other buyers who are interested there are other offers on the table and with respect to what you can disclose based on what each party tells you you can disclose if you don't give them the benefit of the doubt or the most information possible then they're not going to make the same decision that they might make so in my mind the agent goes silent and then all of a sudden this thing pops up and it's under contract with her family member and so this girl over here is like okay I don't want to work with you anymore but the agent doesn't want to cut the contract off because now she's executed here she wants to go back and get the buyer and bring him to a different house which is probably non-existent in Florida and and get her under contract so explain to me the first problem you see with this when somebody brings it to you and says, hey, I have an exclusive buyer's agency agreement. My agent disappeared. I wasn't able to get the house I wanted. Where do I start with my complaint process? One, and what are the questions we start asking the agent? Well, in Florida, I don't know where you start the complaint process. We're in Arkansas. If you're doing an administrative <laughs> complaint, like we have the Real Estate Commission, there's certainly some governing body in Florida that has that same right or a similar process. And there might even be a board before the commission. Could be, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the complaint process, the the contract is the first thing I always want to see. I want to see what was created. I mean, that's what you get. You get in writing what's out there, what the obligation was, because we don't know what the Florida form says as far as buyer's agency and how they're to operate. We also don't know in this instance what the rules are in Florida. Like we have our real estate commission rules, like we walked through on the property management episode, where mm-hmm. we have these set of rules of what has to happen during a transaction. Well, self-dealing is one of those rules, and that's kind of the term that we're talking about here today. We haven't mentioned it, but it's self-dealing. It's when an agent deals with themselves, or in this instance, it's a family member, but that's still personal to the agent. And so it, would be, it could be considered self-dealing, and that requires full disclosure, like what you're talking about. So those are the first issues. And then one of the issues that we always look at, too, is damages, though. If you don't have damages or you don't have some level of immediate recourse in this situation where you could end up being the one that buys the property, it may not be worth your time to go for it. That's a really hard question to answer in that situation as far as damages go as well, because like you're saying like, oh, I didn't get the house. Well, what if you got the house and the house had all these horrible things wrong with it and then you terminated the contract anyways? Like, are there damages? And then also you get the house and it turns out to be worth more than you paid for it. I guess you don't want to talk about damages. So there's lots of different things that would encompass that. But then it also takes me straight to paragraph two, which I'm using the Arkansas forms anyways, because they're all I know. Yeah. But property, the real property, it says on our form, shall substantially meet the following requirements other, unless otherwise acceptable by the buyer. So what have you seen in the past or have you ever seen an issue where the property, the real property that the buyer's after and the property they get under contract with are totally different? Yeah. Okay, so when that happens, would this buyer agency agreement hold in the sense that let's say the property, real property, shall substantially meet the following requirements. Let's say it says two-story single-family home on the beach, but the house they end up trying to get is a foreclosure in a neighborhood six miles from the beach Mm -hmm. in a totally different price range. It would apply. The agreement would apply. But what if it doesn't substantially meet the following requirements? Insert text here. You look you look outside the contract at that point in time to substantial performance of the parties or their course of dealing. If the process of what they were looking for changed over time, a court's not going to look at that and say, 
well, yeah, this agreement didn't meet the exact specifics of the house you were initially looking for in a market where there are very few Throw properties <laughs> that you can go find anyways. And all of a sudden say, yeah, this buyer doesn't, didn't have a duty, number one, or is not entitled to a commission, number two. It would harm both parties to do that. It would harm both sides to make that finding. Well, I just want to make sure because I'll be totally honest with you. I fill that out all the time and I'm like property in Arkansas. Because they yeah. change their mind is what I found. And sometimes I deal with a residential You could client. use language of, you know, property suitable to the buyer for purchase or something like that's that. A, that's a good one. So There's we'll, something along those lines that's general. If And this is, we talked about this too, about the, the unauthorized practice of law. When you, you ask this question, things, when you start inserting lines worth of, lines worth of text into these contracts, it can cause a lot of problems like what you just pointed out. Yes, I mean, I can, you know, you've got this exclusive buyer's agency agreement. And if the buyer is seeking one specific property at a certain address, I could see that becoming a problem mm -hmm. because you can say we're after this property and this is an exclusive buyer's agency agreement to last for six months. And then the buyer goes and finds a different property in the, with the agent and the agent says, well, I'm entitled under this contract. And the buyer says, no, you're not. I'm sorry to interrupt this riveting conversation, but it's time for a word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by American Abstract and Title Company. Not only does this place handle most of the real estate transactions that go down in Pulaski County, but they do it with professionalism and no one has more energy than their fearless leader, Andrew Atkins. If you have any concerns whatsoever about your title work, bring your file over to American Abstract Title and know it's going to close on time and in style. I have used American Abstract Title for more than one transaction in my real estate career, and they are not one of the reasons why I host a show called I Hate Real Estate. Remember, at the end of the day, we don't really hate it. We're actually great at it. So my friend Andrew Atkins and American Abstract Title is the place for you to close your business. This episode is brought to you by Campbell and Grooms Law Firm. This small law firm has the tenacity to go after the big guy when your HGTV situation doesn't turn out so great. Remember, we started this show for a reason, and these guys know what to do when things turn upside down. Donald Campbell and Kendall Grooms are the Arkansas Trial Lawyers Association Trial Lawyers of the Year for 2019 20 and I'm pretty sure 21's in the bag. And I've also seen this happen. An exclusive buyer's agency agreement on a specific property where they don't want to work with that agent necessarily if they are out shopping for other homes. They just want to yeah. use this agent if I they did can that. get it. I know you did. That's kind of why I brought it up. There's times where you'll have an agreement. Even though I somebody. didn't actually have a written agreement in place, but we had a buyer's lawyer. agent show us a house and we weren't represented by anybody under an exclusive listing agreement. And that particular agent got mad at me when we bought a different house with a different agent. Well, and that's... That that happens though, and that's the thing is sometimes you're using an agent because you, they have access, they can move quickly. Well, it was they the listing the agent in this exactly, case. and they're in a situation where it's easier for them to show the property. But you may not want them in that position as your fiduciary, which comes down to you trust this person, you expect yep. a higher standard of care, like you were talking about, and they're going to walk you through this whole entire thing. And the exclusive right to sell, the exclusive buyer's agency agreement is kind of what I want to cover today, anyways, in relation to this woman in Florida, mm -hmm. because we do to answer her question. When somebody does you wrong, the only way to figure out if they did you wrong is to make a complaint and to walk through that process with the necessary governing authority, whether yeah. that's the board first and then the commission or getting an attorney and making sure. I mean, I would contact an attorney first mm -hmm. or contact someone at the respective commission or governing body that you have that would do it. A lot of times they'll just recommend you to an attorney and say, we can't give you legal advice, even though several of the people that are there may be attorneys that do these investigations. Some of them are, some of them are not. I have found that but, even the attorneys I know really well do not give you legal advice unless you specifically ask them yeah. for legal advice related to a subject. Because, because they get the same you don't want to waste your time. I mean, I've seen many complaints filed at the Real Estate Commission that are bogus. But we, I think we've talked about the one one time where the guy, the listing had a picture of this. It's probably 10,000 acres of property that was the view from the property and got a real estate commission complaint filed against him because the person said he was advertising all of the land that you could see from the property for sale. That's and that, that ended up in a six month long complaint. And ordeal, it drags where it We had to go agent. back and forth and there was an investigation done about what the intent of this photograph was. It was so stupid. Just a bunch of wasted but money. But that's what that's, the, when that's what you want to look at. You need to look at that and assess it because ultimately that thing got dismissed after six months and lots of time and energy was and money was wasted 
wasted on that process and nothing came out of it. But the guy who made the complaint actually didn't care at all because he got to walk through the whole thing and he may not have cared about the attorney's fees. But that comes down to as an agent too, that make sure that you're very careful in your advertisements and careful in what you say because your representation of your client and of your yeah. property is going to come And it's come beside back. the point. The whole point you of know? me telling that was to say, go talk to somebody before First. you haul off and file a complaint. Yeah. And that's the thing. Attorneys usually are going to give you advice that is going to help you. They're not going to try to tie themselves up with a lawsuit they're not going to win or a complaint that they're not going to be able to represent their client to the best of their ability and earn their keep. So that being said, let's talk about the selling firm's fee because I've actually heard this go a little bit sideways a few times. You mean the buyer's agent fee? No, I mean the selling firm's fee, even <laughs> though we should rewrite that language. I don't want to get in trouble for how many times we say let's rewrite this, but but I do. the selling firm, <laughs> bring it, the selling firm, you know what we're going to rule today? It just hit me. <laughs> That the, selling that the selling firm is the firm buyer's, is the agent. buyer's <laughs> agent. Yeah. Yes, but the selling firm's fee. So let's just read this out loud, especially if you are a new agent. Understand that the selling firm is authorized to accept partial or complete payment of the selling firm's fee from seller or listing firm. This fee will fee this fee this fee will be due at the scheduled closing of the transaction, and buyer is obligated to pay the selling firm's fee. That sentence throws a lot of agents off. Mm -hmm. Should buyer obtain a VA loan, the sole source of the selling firm's fee shall be limited to the payment offered by the seller or listing firm. So break that down for me, Kindle, how it literally says, will paid by the seller or listing firm. And then this fee will be due at scheduled and buyer is obligated to pay selling firm's fee. I have no idea. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't belong in there. Mm -mm. It says buyer is obligated to pay selling firm's fee. So it's we're probably, not giving you any it, legal advice, it's but probably throw that out. The, well, it's... <laughs> It's likely the way that it's scheduled on the settlement sheet at closing, the way that it's listed, um, because technically that's a fee due by the buyer for services. It may be a consideration type of deal because it would be weird in a contract to have an obligation of one party to take some action on behalf of someone else with no monetary payment being due from the other party because a contract has to be a promise for a promise. So I could see where that would be. It's contradictory. An issue. Yes. Well, and this is contradictory to the listing agent, or the listing agreement. Because yeah. the listing agreement says, hey, I'm the listing agent and you are the seller. And, and I'm going to pay the buyer's agent. Yeah. If there's co brokerage, I'm going to split it's, that. It's not even in contradiction with that. It is, but it's in contradiction with itself within those <laughs> couple of sentences. There. Yeah. Which but I think, kinda, I, think, I think ultimately it's, it's for contractual purposes, for. Um, What's the word I'm looking for for legal purposes, mm -hmm. background technicality? Well, and that's the and thing. It's the way that it's structured on the settlement sheet at closing. But it's the thing that really trips up a lot of people when they send this agreement to their clients. And I've had this experience in my first couple of years in real estate. I was like, um, how do I explain this to my to my client who says I literally attracted them to me by saying like, buy a house with me because you don't have to pay a commission when you're a buyer. And then they read that. And then and they're like, buyer's obligated to pay selling firms fee. Aren't you selling firm? Which is... Yeah confusing enough so anyways we should have asked andrew this question andrew we're gonna need you to chime in other than at the ad space yeah. <laughs> i'll call him after this and find out in fact we should have an episode where we call him and ask all the questions we have yeah. filed up in consideration of the services to be formed before be performed by the selling firm the buyer shall pay the selling firm a professional fee of and it talks about a percentage of the gross amount of the real estate contract entered into by the buyer plus any other number for professional services rendered but in actuality and in practice in the state of arkansas Typically what happens is you have a listing firm that lists on the actual MLS listing by your agent compensation and then that's paid from the selling firm excuse me, from the listing mm -hmm. firm's agreement at closing. So that it kind of explains why it's broken down on the settlement sheet that way. Yeah. But just to um unconfuse anyone or to pull this out and explain exactly what it means, you're supposed to have your buyer's agent commission paid by the listing seller side. Yes. And if you if, are a buyer and you hire an agent, you're not supposed to pay any commission. Right. And then you can in the sense that like I had a deal go down it can one be time. negotiated. Right. And I had a deal go down one time where like we're not proponents of and advocates of dual agency. But there are times periodically where it's happened to me in my career where sometimes the two sellers like I'm represent the seller and I introduced my seller to another guy who wanted to sell him some property and I wasn't afraid. So I just put them together. And what happened is they ended up cutting a deal and then came back to me and said, look, you hooked us up. So we're going to have you do all the paperwork. Here's the fee that you're going to collect and the buyer's going to pay it. And it blew my mind at first because I'm like, why? I mean, shouldn't the seller pay it? But then I realized, you know, they cut a deal. A good deal works for everybody. They had that discussion, you know, came back to me and said, write the contract. And in that scenario, I didn't mind at all to be a dual agent, especially because the buyer did pay that fee. So I mean, I've handled transactions before where 
it'll be negotiated that the buyer of the property is paying part of my attorney's fees when I'm representing the seller. Well, I mean, that kind of thing can be negotiated. Anything can be negotiated. But it kind of comes back to, for me, and this the reason that I want to bring this section of it up, is that for this woman who is buying this property, her agent acting for a family member really brings up a whole set of complications if Florida has the same setup that we do with respect to listing agent paying. So let's say you have a 6% listing agreement, and then you're, you're cousin or sister whatever realtor situation you put an offer in on a property and she's like hey if you buy this house i'm going to get paid three percent of the commission i can split that back to you which is not legal but if she's self-dealing she's not worried about legalities anyways um the point of making is that you make money to buy property as a real estate agent so if you are buying this property for an investment it's kind of a credit back to you especially if you're the one who's going to flip it or own it or turn Mm -hmm. around and do it and i think that that's probably something that has come up across your desk before right yes He's like, I can't disclose, but I mean, it, it happens. Yeah. yeah. There's People buy property specifically to make money or yeah. they cut back. Have you ever like been in a situation? <laughs> have you ever been in a situation where somebody has actually collected a commission and then paid a commission out to another party? If we did, it was in a specific case that we had almost 10 years ago. And I don't remember the specific details that were in that one. Yeah, well, I like that you just don't comment on it. I'd be like, and then this maybe happened. <laughs> That's the difference. Well, you know, I've told you before I had it happen to myself where we tried. I tried to personally buy a property for an investment and hired an agent and found out later that that property was auctioned and I wasn't told about it by the agent and that represented right. me. And I asked who bought it and what they bought it for, and they bought it for basically 20%, 15%, 20% less than what I was willing to pay for it. And I said, who bought it? And some investment group is what the answer was. And I ended up looking it up, and the person who was my agent was a part of the investment group that bought it. See, so, I mean, it's happened to me before. But that's, like, wrong. And I don't that's do so real property investments. I mean, if people are in here going, this guy's a gazillionaire. He's buying property. I'm not. No, and actually. And I don't buy That would have been a very very unusual and big deal for me to do that and we had a grand dream of an idea i know and, you did and, and i know it what that grand fell dream apart is. right and i'm kind of glad it did because covid would have destroyed it well i'm also glad end, it did but. because you wouldn't have had the time and energy to put in i hate real estate but that being said it's one of those things where you and i and actually as a full disclosure too you're not really a real property investor and i think part of that has to do with the stuff you see every day i mean every single day you've got issues related to real estate and you're i'm one of those people that like you can say whatever you want about me i have an appraisal license and a broker's license and i don't flip property no way the only reason i would be invest in property would be for the tax benefits not to be a property owner (laughs) yeah i don't want to be a property manager or a further property owner other than my personal residence now I mean, I might want to own a film studio someday, but that's a different story. Anyway, anyway. You know, you'd buy a lake house if you could. Uh, Yeah, you're like probably that. right. You know what we could do? Let's be careful. We might invest in a lake house. Okay. Okay, so here's the thing. There are boxes underneath here that talk about whether or not your agent can represent both parties. And that's something that I think was part of her issue as well, is she says, well, now I'm cut out of the deal and I don't get to have a uh, part. And she ghosted her up until the property went under contract and then she came back. In the situation where she can't represent both, I think that was another reason why this agent would have ghosted her because she would have had, it seems like, a relationship with the seller you know, and a relationship with the buyer. I hate to think from an evil standpoint, but wouldn't, had it, been, job. wouldn't it have been smarter <laughs> for this agent to have submitted this offer and yeah. also submitted the family member's offer at a slightly better deal mm-hmm. and just told the person they chose another offer over yours? Yeah, it probably would have, but that's not the way things go down these days. I've not. actually seen a lot. You know, nothing against Florida, but you see all these jokes about the crazy things that people in Florida do. Yep. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. Everybody does. They're funny. Yeah, they are funny. And the other thing is, like, I, for me, though, I'll be totally honest, when I think of Florida, I think of alligators. I just, for some reason, that's all I can think of. I'm scared of it. I don't want to go there. I've been to Florida one time in my whole entire life, and I probably won't go back um just I'm going because to florida in nine days you know what i'm just i think we should take the show on the road every time you go somewhere other than florida i'm there okay <laughs> like i would have gone to dallas for the arkansas my, my game. kids like disney world so oh well lucky them so don't buy anything outside of disney it's crazy okay. high <laughs> yeah, <for laughs> but real. the point is you can't represent both um unless you have a full-on agreement to do it. But then also with respect to just representing one, let's say that you are the buyer's agent, what you just talked about with confidential information and giving information about an offer, there is also some things to talk about here with respect to buyer agency. So when you're reading this form, hopefully you're reading this form as an agent or a client, it says right here, it talks about the buyer waives any claim now or hereafter arising out of any conflicts of interest from the selling firm representing both parties. 
This is actually on the part that says mm -hmm. may represent buyer and seller. It says they acknowledge the selling firm verbally disclosed that the selling firm may represent buyers and other, and the buyer has consented to the selling firm representing them both in the exclusive buyer agency agreement. It is not a breach of fiduciary duty to inform a seller, also represented by the selling firm, of the existence or possibility of offers to purchase the property other than those contemplated or submitted by the buyer. Mm -hmm. Break that down. It just means you're, it's the same thing we talked about before. It requires full disclosure of everything except that confidential information such as someone, the amount of money somebody makes or what they're willing to pay for the property or sell the property for. Do All you, other details are on the table. I'm going to tell you right now, we both know it is too difficult a line to walk. I mean, it's this, like I have a bobby pin. It's this thin, razor thin line that you're walking right there to have a conversation with the buyer and have their best interest in mind and know what they're willing to offer and know what they're, tell me that you haven't had said to me while well, I'm willing to go it's, here. It's a 100% conflict of interest that is legal. It's absolutely what it is because then the agent, <laughs> the agent then can, it's, it's a, it's the equivalent of self-dealing. Like we've talked about the agent then has the opportunity to get the best deal on the table from these two parties that would benefit the agent by increasing the amount of the agent's commission that is paid. Yeah. And especially, you know, and you want to hope that your agent doesn't do that. And, the good agents and the ethical agents won't do that, but there will be agents that take advantage of this scenario. Well, and there's also opportunities, and I just want to bring this one to the table because I'm in one right now where I had an opportunity to be a dual agent and offer on both sides, you know, a buyer and a seller situation, but we're dealing with probate. We're dealing with disclosure issues. We've got all these things on the table and it comes to me from you and I say, oh, I've got to, you know, I know that I can bring a buyer to the situation. I know I can, but if I do, I'm going to be going through this with the seller and I'm going to be trying to get the best deal for the buyer. And I can't do that. And you're walking a tightrope. So instead of walking the tightrope, because I'm experienced and have a wonderful attorney to give me legal advice, I brought in an agent from my own team who I know can be benefited, who I have no relationship with outside of work, who I can say, hey, do, would you like to represent a buyer in a transaction where I have a listing agreement and you can earn commission and this is what it is and we've got well permission to show point is do you want to operate on this side and he said yeah and I said just keep in mind you can't tell me anything at all about that buyer about what they're willing to pay about what they're willing to offer and it's hard even for him because he wants to come and say okay this is what they're willing no 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 no. I can't hear anything mm -hmm. all I can see is what you write on paper because otherwise I'm in a situation where I have confidential information of the buyers yep then I'm responsible to disclose and if because you I'm just, the fiduciary yeah, for the seller. If you then give me that, even if it's an agent in your own firm and they give you the confidential information at that point, you're under a duty to disclose it to your client. And that's the thing is you're putting me in a situation where I cannot operate professionally because if he says it out loud to me and I know they're willing to pay 5000 over, or I know they're willing to pay 7000 over, and I know it, my fiduciary responsibility, I love that word, to the seller. It's to say don't take anything less than 5000 over. Less. I know that they're willing to pay this. Yeah. And so anyways, that to be said, you are walking a tightrope all the time when you're dealing with a buyer and going into a situation where you know confidential information. What you disclose, and especially in writing, is going to come back on you at some point if the deal doesn't go the way they want it to. So yeah. we can get off that little section of the buyer agency agreement. Now, we need to make Aaron make the text like scroll on the screen when we're reading through it. That's what we need to do. He's can you gonna, handle that? Can you do that? He's rolling his eyes at us. Yeah, right he's now. over here rolling his eyes. Yeah, he's like, why do they interrupt me? I'm trying to edit over I know. Here. He's like, I'm working. I'm he's not like, even listening like, to what these I was crazy to people this, are talking about. He's trying to make it as simple as an editing possible process as possible. And we're yeah. like, hold on, let's talk over each other and put some text on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> this is just showing you what we can do. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, we're going to skip past earnest money because we know how we feel about that. Yeah. Uh, fair housing. So another thing in her complaint. Maybe she just didn't like me. Maybe it's because I'm this. Maybe it's because I'm that. It talks right here that fair You're housing. You're talking about our Florida ladies. Our complaint. Florida lady. Yeah. She was not an alligator. Now, we are the model state when it comes down to contracts. So to be fair, we've thought of everything in the buyer agency agreement. We don't know what Florida's forms look like. I have since requested them. You can make a friend yeah. in EXP. That's what's really nice about EXP is you can actually go into other states or countries and make a friend in your little EXP world and then walk them out to the lobby and be like, can you show me what your buyer's agency agreement yeah. looks like? So I'll bring that back on another episode in the future. I just edited the floor, the um, the forms, the commercial forms for EXP to use in Arkansas. I know that's really exciting, but I don't work for EXP commercial, so that's great. I, I work for EXP Realty. We're just, <laughs> just throwing, them a, we're just throwing them a shout out. <laughs> shout out to the commercial side. <laughs> Anyways, the point in my fair housing comment was that fair housing is not a state situation. It's a nationwide situation. And as an agent, what you have to remember is that if you oust somebody like this and there's any reason why they might think so, maybe 
I wore a cross ring. That means I, you could you could discriminate against me because I'm religious. You could discriminate against me because I'm a woman or because I'm a certain race, handicap, sexual orientation, my familial status. Anything that you do as an agent that's going to make this buyer mad if they're different from you in any way or if you actually did it because you're a jerk, fair housing is going to come in play. And talk to me a little bit about a fair housing complaint. You basically have to wear a blindfold. Pretty much. But I mean, what happens if somebody does a fair housing complaint? It's worse than a normal complaint because it isn't just even statewide. It can be, but I don't, I've never dealt with that before. Um, because Arkansas is full of wonderful people. Yeah. Um, I've not done that before. And I don't know what the penalties are behind a fair housing complaint. I don't know if it's a monetary penalty or if certain actions can be taken as a criminal penalty. I find it hard to believe that it's a criminal penalty. Mm-mm, but I think um, that it probably is closer to unlicensing or getting your license yeah, revoked. Yeah, some kind than of eth- so not necessarily an. Well, it's probably a similar result to what the ethics committee at the Realtors Association could do, where they could, they can't take your licensure, but they can take your designation as a realtor away. They can cause additional CLE or CE in your case to to occur, continuing education courses and hours, additional testing, things like that to happen. I would think it would take a pretty extreme event of discrimination of some kind to revoke somebody's license. I'm sure. But at the same time, if you damage somebody in that way because of that and it can be proven, I mean, that's a whole different thing. But I just wanted to touch on the fair housing because I also think that agents don't realize when you're acting as somebody's fiduciary, you have to do not just the confidential information, not just protecting their best interests, not walking them from start to finish, but also realizing that every single action you take from start to finish will be scrutinized. Yep. And that's why it's important. And and there's a big difference too in discriminating on one of those factors and just not liking your client as well. <laughs> I have had some clients that I don't I like. I have two. Full disclosure. I have two. I mean You only but, have two? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, you have also. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, pretty much all of our clients, we get along very well with our clients. But I've had some clients even that I get along well with that I'm like, hey, this person's a jerk. Mm-hmm. But you, everybody still needs legal help and they're entitled to appropriate representation. Yeah. But I that, mean, So there's, there's a difference there in what would be discriminatory against someone and just not liking someone. Did she actually express in her message that there was some kind of discriminatory nature? She said she thinks that. At the end of this transaction, which I was trying to pull up our um, Facebook page, but it full just disclaimer, the only thing wrong with our studio is the Wi-Fi. I mean, I'm not saying anything <laughs> bad about her, but it doesn't make sense that you would make a discrimination allegation as the reason why you were treated differently, but at the same time blame it on the fact that she wanted to get it to her family members. Those two things don't... They're not correlated, and I think that's what I was saying, that I think she's grasping at the end. I think yeah. at the end of it, she's just like, well, maybe it's because I it's go a to a different church. it's a whole lot better or, yeah. of an argument to make that you dealt with your own family members behind my back when you had an obligation to me. And most people and are if motivated. if I'm a lawyer, that's where I'm like, yeah, let's do that one instead of the discrimination case. There's definitely more cause there, but the other, and there's damages and numbers that you can measure. But the other part of that as well is, um, that's probably what happened, first of all. And secondly, trying to throw that on there at the end, it's a very subjective situation. It's not something where you can just walk in and say black and white, there was numbers. This is what happened. You can walk in and be like, well, maybe she didn't like her. Well, I don't like a lot of my clients. I mean, Now I love them all. But in the beginning, I took on every client that came my way. And that comes down to that lesson of choosing who you work with and knowing that they're a good fit for you and making sure if you get a snake bit situation that you get the venom out quickly and don't carry that thing all the way across with a dead Mm -hmm. leg. (laughs) Um, But that being said, you do have to be careful. And it's not discrimination to not want to represent a specific client. If you get into a situation where you know, and I'm sure you've had people come to you where they're like, hey, I did something horrible would you represent me? And you're like, no, the evidence is stacked against you and you're a jerk. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's not discrimination. Recently, yeah. Yeah. Well, ha ha, kick rocks guy. I'm sorry. It's not funny. I mean, I know everybody makes mistakes, but some people do it on purpose. Everybody is entitled to adequate legal representation. That doesn't mean that a lawyer in a civil setting has to take your case. That's true. I'm sorry. I got... I thought you were doing that for that. I was like, that can't be that shocking to you. No, that's not shocking at all. I was actually thinking about how I should have probably, I mean, I don't want to look surprised by anything I see in a a buyer's agency agreement. But every day. You're like, hey, I've executed hundreds of these. Oh, there's a big surprise. Well, it's not that. It's just that the way that it disclaims it, it's like the limitation of responsibility. And Uh it talks about the firm, you know, and it's like, I understand that the buyer has to get an inspection and that it's buyer beware and that the buyer has to understand what's wrong with it. But I just find it interesting that there was a necessity to put this in the contract stating that whatever's wrong with the property, it says even here in finding properties for the buyer, including but not limited to damage or injury to property or persons um, and reasonable attorney's fees, that's going to be the responsibility of the selling firm if there's some issue related to the property uh, and there's 
property be free of mechanical, electrical, structural infestation, support, environmental, or other defects. Basically saying that if there's any issue with the property, the selling firm is not responsible for the condition of the property and strongly recommends buyer obtains all 30 third-party inspections deemed necessary by the buyer to determine the condition of the property, including without limitation by those provided in the real estate contract. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm surprised that that even has to be in there because in the Arkansas, there is a 10-day, 10 10-business 10 day automatic buyer beware period. I think that that's saying that. That, the, that the buyer's agent is responsible for coordinating that. It is. It says that the buyer acknowledges the seller may be utilizing video and audio surveillance as well without the selling firm's knowledge. No. Sellers may be able to listen or view conversations in or about properties and buyers should be aware that any discussions of negotiating strategies held in property may not be confidential. The buyer hereby agrees to defend, indemnify, save, and hold selling firm harmless from all liability or claims arising from seller or listing firm utilizing any information obtained through those means. So essentially, if you go into the property and you talk about like, man, we really like it, we really like this yard, we're willing to pay five, 6000 over, and the seller's sitting there with their earphones listening to it, and their agent comes to him and tells them, which that's a different agent, but their agent comes to him and tells him, hey, I've got an offer. They're going to be like, well, I heard them talking inside the oh, house. Yeah. I know they- somebody recently that sold a house up in Northwest Arkansas. And, you know, the new disclosure in Arkansas, the new form actually says, are you monitoring this property by video or other surveillance? And the answer is yes. And they just had an, one of those interior ring cameras sitting on their mantle. I mean, just sitting there. It's not like it was hidden behind the bush or anything. And the people are, <laughs> the people are talking about what they like and don't like about the property. And you have to you, be careful with you're that. You're sitting there, and it records motion. They sit there and listen to them and watch, and they watched multiple people walk through their house. For me, it's like I want one of those, but I also don't because I feel like I would want to call them after and be like, look, I tried to get the dishes done before I left. I was busy. Like, don't judge me. Yeah. Like, it would be hard to sit there and watch somebody walk through your home and be so judgy about it. But It's not that hard. That's coming from somebody whose house is always clean, so whatever. No, I'm, that's not <laughs> But it's uh, when, I, when when we sold the house up on Majestic that you sold for me, we uh, I, I had a ring doorbell and a ring camera that went out on the driveway, and people would stand out on the driveway and talk about what they liked and didn't like about the house. <laughs> and I you hear people go, "We're fit, we're going to make an offer this afternoon on this. When can we pull the paperwork together?" And you're like, "Okay, cool." And then the offer never comes through, and you're like, "I wonder what happened after they left." I was about to say, full disclosure, it does suck when your seller does that, and they're and they're really like following up on it because you would you would send me messages and be like, "These people are totally making an offer." I'm like, "I'll yeah. believe it when I see it in mm-hmm. writing." The frustrating thing is when somebody walks through the house and says, "I really hate the paint color of this one wall." We're not making an offer and you like you realize that in an afternoon you can change the paint color on you could wall. probably have asked you guys too to just throw in a couple hundred bucks yeah. for the paint and you would have done it at yeah. the time not not that i heard that on recording or anything but that being said these these are really important points that she didn't get to this point because she didn't have the ability to go in and inspect the property and go from there but i thought it was important to at least mention the fact that your buyer's agent has to deal with a lot of different things and i don't know about these other agents in central arkansas but to be totally honest with you it is rare that a disclosure is online and i review it prior to the showing because i don't have you know especially i'm going to show 15 houses i'm going to go show the houses back to back to back to back to back and what they're interested in i'm going to dive deeper about but i'm not looking through the seller disclosure on every single property i show before i show it just disclaimer so let's talk about the recourse that our florida lady has and does not have okay because i mean i think i've heard enough to be able to tell her what you would need to do in this situation absent looking at the contract and that kind of stuff i'm just making sure there's nothing else okay i'm not the attorney here go ahead well (laughs) that doesn't mean i have privilege (laughs) no but you're right we need to answer her question because i can go down a a rabbit hole when it comes to this buyer agency because Ultimately, she's got a complaint at whatever governing board may be out there. If she actually has proof that it was sold to a family member, um, which I'm assuming that she does since she brought that to our attention. She did. And the big thing is she's got, so she's got Facebook posts where the person is like, congratulations, my sister got this yeah. house. We've been working on it for weeks. And she's like, a uh, screenshot. Yeah. So, but, and and then go ahead when you go through this as far as bodies so and two compare primary, them to our bodies. Two primary real estate relief things of relief or damages that we could request here are one of them that typically comes up as specific performance which i know you know what that is i love that and number two is just straight up damages monetary damages that you incurred specific performance is not available unless you get a written contract period so she doesn't have a specific performance in arkansas she would not have a specific performance claim because there is no contract to enforce someone to, to to perform specifically specific performance means if you refuse to close or refuse to perform some obligation under your contract, usually it's a closing. Somebody refuses to actually go to the table and sign the documents. That's happened to me. You have a cause of action in Arkansas for a judge to rule that they are required to, and if they will not sign, the judge will appoint a third party to sign on their behalf by way of a court order. Um, she doesn't have that here. From the monetary side, 
it's, it gets really hairy in real estate transactions because you have to assume, number one, from the monetary side, that even had your offer been submitted, it would have been the accepted offer. Assumption number one. So you have to make that assumption. Number two, you have to then assume what property you would have gotten in the future had because you didn't get this property. And so then you have to calculate, well, did I have to pay more for this property? Are my taxes higher on this property? Is my insurance higher on this property? Were my moving expenses higher on this property? And you have to make all of these assumptions to calculate what your potential damages would have been. Did it impact my loan rate that I got oh, if I got a loan? Is, my brain's going straight to real estate. So over a 30-year period yeah. of time, how much more interest would I have paid on this loan, assuming that I make all 360 payments under my mortgage? Would I have at some point in the future refinanced to a 15-year mortgage and my interest been lower? It's just so many different factors go into it, all of which have to be assumptions. There's not a fixed, specific amount that can be there until you actually go buy another property. And even at that point, a lot of those damages that I just listed out are still based upon assumption. So, and so it's really difficult to recover a substantial amount of money. But what about... And, I'm just, and then the only other things you can get, aside attorneys. from the differing transactions, are if you had a contract in place. Did I put a contract in place where I incurred a survey fee or an inspection fee or an appraisal, or fee, an or appraisal or. fee where I'm now responsible for that even though I didn't get the property? That still, like specific performance, assumes a contract exists. So the only thing you can get non-contractually <clears throat> are these assumptions based upon a future transaction that you haven't yet entered into. Well, first of all, good job. And secondly, <laughs> when it comes down to extraordinary assumptions, which I have been known yeah. to be making in my other line of work, let me just object here. Okay. <laughs> Look at all my legal jargon. Yeah. Um, the buyer's agency agreement is a contract. It's an exclusive right to, to represent the buyer and to go in there and do this, right? So if I make an agreement, and this is just a question, if I have a, but don't put me down, if it's a buyer agency agreement, that is an executed contract for me to perform as a buyer's agent. So if in the time period listed within my agency agreement, using this agreement, I go in there and I ghost my client within that same period and sell the property that they ask me in writing to make an offer on to a family member and then make that evident on social media mm -hmm. showing that I did ignore my client for this time period but managed to execute the transaction with somebody else who I happen to be related to. Yep. Do I have something there? You have a great case at a commission or a regulatory body, administrative body, or a governing body. But there's probably no money. You don't honey. have any money. Mm -mm. I mean, you just don't. Yeah. Because a breach of contract under Arkansas law can you can win a breach of contract but case and recover nominal debt. You can recover one dollar and you still won, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Plus, it doesn't if you go ahead and you spend all that money on the attorney taking you in and taking you out and giving you all this advice, and then you win your dollar and or your breach of contract. You've still spent all that depending money. And you still on, don't have a house. Depending on the manner of the breach, the law in Arkansas is that your damages, your recoverable damages, are either. The damages that are the, the amount of money, no, I'm sorry, it's the position that the parties would have been in had the contract never been executed, if it's undone, or likewise, the position the party would have been in had the uh, contract been completely complied with, yeah, and what damages were sustained because it wasn't fully complied with. And there's just, right now, there's not anything there, and there probably won't be enough to ever warrant spending ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on a lawsuit. It's just an assumption, and we both know what that does. Mm -hmm. We don't get wanna... you in trouble. You don't want to speculate or assume. He said get you in trouble. You're so nice. That was such a PG way to put it. Um, <laughs> we do have PG presence today. So. Yes, we do. <laughs> so that being said, we will wrap it up on the buyer's agency agreement, which is not the shortest podcast we've ever done. Thank you very much. And secondly, the ruling is important here today, though, because at the end of the day, as a buyer's agency agreement, you're not just representing yourself as a buyer's agent. You're representing yourself as a realtor, hopefully, that you have that designation. You're providing an opportunity to represent somebody on the on the biggest purchase probably that they're going to make of their life. And it's your job to make sure that they are at least feel seen. So if you're not going to represent them in a transaction or you have somebody else that you know is going to make an offer and you know there's a conflict of interest, the number one thing you can do, disclose, disclose, disclose. My sister is also interested in this house. I know this information. She's going to make an offer. And if your sister has given you the ability to do so, or you has said out loud in front of you and you have signed in a contract with this buyer, she's going to make an offer for $150,000 and you need to be aware of that if you're going to submit an offer as well. We're good at this. That's all I get. Just a, mm-hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> we are good at this. Yeah. So uh, if you need some more information or law advice, I know a guy that you can call. But for today, we're going to be done hating on the agent who ousted our friend in Florida. We do appreciate our Florida listeners and those of you around the country. I was going to say the same thing. We appreciate the contact. I hope we get more of these. Yeah, anytime that you guys want to reach out. Not just to Kindle, to the I hate real estate. You just have to understand, and another disclaimer that it doesn't create attorney client privilege. It doesn't create any kind of privilege or contractual relationship between any of us. No, but it it does give us the privilege of talking about it. And it's for the people that send in a message, it's a whole lot cheaper to listen to the podcast than it is to hire an attorney to give you an opinion on the issue. And ultimately, you have to recommend that they go get an opinion from a local attorney since we don't know the Florida laws. It could be totally different there. Right. And even if you're in Arkansas, all of that being said, when it comes down to it, listening to the podcast hopefully is going to provide value and information to you in the real estate industry or as a consumer so that you get into a situation where damages are not something that you have to worry about incurring and or taking care of in court. Now, just real quickly, well, before we rule on this, I will mention that at some point you may be paying for this podcast if you are an agent because there are things in the works hopefully, that will help you do that because nobody likes to sit in continued education when they could sit around and listen to us talk, right? And that w- I think that would be a separate podcast. Of We're not going to make people be pay for fun. our general public podcast that we do. No, but, but if they want there to... There may be the opportunity for more specific, focused, educational type podcasts to act as some sort of required hours or licensing requirement. We hope. We hope, we hope. But that being said... The more information that you ask of us, the more information we're able to give you. So if you have a burning question, send it in to I Hate Real Estate on our Facebook page or send us an email. I will put that email on the end of the screen. The editor's looking at me with rolled eyes again, but we're going to do hey, it. He, he's the one that wants me, the lawyer, to say, you know, you need to like us and all these things. Do I don't it. Even, I'm like, I don't know. Coerce them. I don't even know the correct, like us. The correct millennial they language already like to us. use. Aaron does. The I correct don't. millennial language is follow us there on Facebook. Go. Subscribe on YouTube, and when you get yourself in trouble, call Camel and Grooms. And Aaron's going to have all this on the screen when we do. (laughs) Everybody vote for Aaron, Editor of the Year. That's right. Okay, let's rule on a couple things. Number one, pick a good agent and make sure that they are not representing other people in your area on the same property. All right. And secondly, can we please get a removal out here from this form that says that the buyer is responsible for paying the buyers? Yeah, we can do that too, but you're leaving one off. The selling firm is the buyer agency. That's right. Boom. (laughs) Three for you. See you next time on an episode of I Hate Real Estate. Bye. Bye.